Welcome to the Experts in Sport podcast, brought to you by the School of Sport, Exercise and Health Sciences at Loughborough University. This podcast seeks to bring together the worlds of academia and professional practice. If you're interested in the latest research and trends in sport and want to hear from experts from around the world, then subscribe now because this is the podcast for you. I'm your host, Martin Foster, Applied Sport Management Lead at Loughborough University. This week, I'm joined by two sports psychology experts, Professor Paul Willeman from the Free University in Brussels and Dr. Carl Steptoe, Sport and Performance Lead here at Loughborough University. They're here to discuss sports psychologists, what they do, how to do it, and what the future holds. Coming up, we're going to learn what a sports psychologist actually does. We'll touch upon how performance psychologists are changing practice within sport through creating an athlete-centered approach driven by coaches, supported by experts. Then we're going to ask, are academia and industry doing enough to ensure graduates are ready for the world of work? But before we do, we'll start off with letting you get to know our guests a little better, starting with Carl. Uh, thanks, Martin. Um, Carl Steptoe, I'm the Sport and Performance Psychology Lead at Loughborough. Um, best job in the world. I get to uh, combine teaching and lecturing with working with our student athletes in our performance sports. Um, a background in professional sport, was a golfer in a previous life. Uh, I often get asked how good I was at that, and the fact I'm here with you now should tell you not as good as I wanted to be. Was it the physical or the psychological that, that ruined your performance? Uh, good question. Question. Definitely the psychological. Uh, was was fascinated by how a, a sport that I loved uh, and wanted to be involved in 24/7 became a sport I, I hated um, and wanted to, to to get away from as, as quick as possible. But um, yeah, so I just got fascinated in that, and then as a as a coach for 10 years, just just feeling like um, the technical tactical side of things um, wasn't the the main way that I could help the the people that I was working with, and it always kept coming back to. Uh, the psychological demands of the sport and and yeah hence my interest in this area and and my time now at at Loughborough working with athletes across sports and you've got experience in other sports as well now yeah so we have uh, a a growing list of performance sports here uh, including netball uh, rugby in the men's and women's game cricket um, and prior to coming to Loughborough working with Leicester City um, for for the last six seven years with their academy so working with players from eight uh, up to 23 years of age um, Leicestershire Cricket Club uh, working with golfers on the European Tour um, and our GB wheelchair tennis team from London to Rio so a real broad range of sports Uh, and in fact took a a good amount of time away from golf uh, because I felt like I was too close to that when I first got involved uh, uh, in in professional practice so just starting to come back to golf now in the last few years Brilliant and yourself Paul? Uh, Well Paul Willeman um, Brussels University the Free University of Brussels Um, background clinical psychologist maybe relevant later on in the story Um, looking at mental health of elite athletes uh, actually a full professor in sports psychology and be, uh, being hired in by the Dutch Olympic Committee for the last five years to uh, work with their uh, Olympic and Paralympic staff and athletes in preparing for, we did uh, Rio, uh, Pyeongchang, now Tokyo and then uh, Beijing and Paris and uh, not on a one-to-one like Carl, I'm not doing the individual consultation but I'm actually managing and organizing organizing all the services we need to provide to uh, our elite athletes in the Netherlands. Brilliant. Sounds sounds an impressive career um, and got you to where you are now. Um, regarding the conversation we're going to be having, we're going to be trying to look at um, what sports psychology is and how we can help students or people want to develop in sports psychology and grow their career. Um, so for the majority of this session, I'll hand over to Carl, who's going to ask the questions. I may jump in with some... Um, some things from a from a less academic, a less high profile uh, questions um, to maybe help listeners and realistically help myself to understand some of the things you might be talking about. Okay, so over, over to you, Carl. Yeah, I think um, when we were, you know, looking forward to having the conversation with Paul, it was really to get uh, a different perspective on where we are with sports psychology because I talked to uh, our students who are very concerned about the world of work that they might go into 
uh, and I try and chip away um, at this fixed belief that there's not a lot of work out there and, and um, they don't know what the world of work will look like. Are they going to be stood courtside? Are they going to be giving presentations? Um, and that just led me to reflect on, on my training and that experience I had after six or seven years of training, going through that Viva, talking to my supervisors and assessors. And it was all going really well and at the end of it they said, that's great Carl, so what does a sports psychologist do? And I didn't have an answer. Really? I I'd really, I couldn't think in that moment what a concise, complete answer would okay. be. And without, well, I am going to put you on the spot. Have really? you got any yeah. thoughts on, on how you would answer such a question? Oh, well, I think there are a couple of perspectives we could use, actually. If you look at the basic training, you could say, well, there's a route through uh, psychology. Uh -huh. And then you specialize in the domain of sport or exercise or movement which brings you into the field of sport and exercise psychology. That's the first perspective. The, the other perspective could be, well, the applied side. What do you actually do? So you could look at uh, working with athletes, working with parents, uh, working with uh, NGBs, for example, or going into exercise psychology, working with obese people, working with uh, psychiatric patients. So the definition of what we do is sometimes not only the education, but also the uh, practice in the applied field we do. I would say if you uh, would like to have some kind of uh, a framework, I would say we should be the specialist in understanding how individuals, teams, groups develop with respect to their behavior uh -huh. and suggest how we could optimize their development, whether it be by self-regulation. So I want to become better in my sport. I want to become a better student. I want to uh, be better in rehab, for example, or by the people surrounding our individual athlete or student, helping them. So what do I need to know to help uh, an, an athlete going from junior to, to senior level as a coach? So we should be able to provide them with the expertise and competencies to help them help the athlete. That would be a very broad picture or framework, I think. And given that breadth, do you feel that the title, uh, I guess this is what I think about like that, that title that we've, we work towards in this country as a way of educating the public and ensuring um, good practice, do you feel that that title is then a little constraining and restricting the fact that it's sport and exercise psychologist here and yet you've, in that summary there, sort of touched on a number of areas mm. that would work, on pitch, off pitch, off court, on court, in the mental health space, in yeah. the performance space? Yeah. Well, perhaps a, a useful way of looking at that particular point is uh, you, you got a, a kind of behavior which we could say we, we need to enhance, optimize. So we'll educate people on how to do a mental routine, for example, uh -huh. or how to use visualization in preparing for a, a 100 meters dash. Okay, That's making stronger what people already bring to you. On the other hand, you may have what we call subclinical or clinical behavior, which does not allow the athlete, the student, or your colleague or coach to function on a daily basis, or even worse, brings them to mental illness. Uh -huh. uh, well, if you look at those two components, uh, and they're actually part of one continuum, then you would say that the basic education may be different for those providing that kind of support. When it goes into enhancing what's already there, like mental routines and so on, somebody with a sports science background would be very able to do this. Now, when it comes into uh, the behavior that doesn't really is functional, is subclinical or clinical, then I feel this, this is for psychologists because mm -hmm. they will, they, or they should have at least the basic uh, knowledge or the expertise knowledge to work with what's not functioning, the clinical uh, behavior. So working with the same title for two different uh, levels of expertise or background is confusing. Confusing. And uh, my point is very clear. Uh, if you use the title of sport or exercise psychologist, then you're trained as a psychologist. Yeah. If you use sports psychology, 
as a sports scientist or uh, then you would be a user of the expertise but you wouldn't call yourself psychologist in many countries around Europe the title is uh, prohibited well it's only limited to those with a, an education in psychology you cannot use any way psychologist in your name if you're not a psychology graduate yeah. uh, so I think we, we need clarity and uh, the fact that we as professionals are already discussing this well I can imagine that the, the public at large doesn't see or doesn't understand the difference and yet to the quality of service they, they would expect it's hugely important to know am I talking to somebody with a grasp of psychology mm. or am I talking with all due respect to somebody who wants in, to enhance my competencies but doesn't understand what the perhaps the mental issue is yes yeah I, I think um, it's fair to say that if we had 10 psychologists sports psychologists in the room then they're going to be very different practitioners uh, based on their training route and 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 where they work I think in I've never maybe I'm noticing it more but in the last year um, been uh, asked to uh, speak with a sport organization or a client group about potential work and, and I've actually been in a position where I've I don't know if it's feeling confident to, but I've actually turned down work because I feel like I'm setting myself up to fail mm. or setting colleagues up to fail. And, and being asked <laughs> on one day to be working with athletes that have got some presenting issues that might be in that clinical space, and on another day I'm being asked to give a motivational talk. Um, and, and, and with one, um, one potential client recently, I was actually asked if I could just be around so that when things go wrong, could I just reframe it mm. so that I could help that athlete perform in the next five minutes and it's just such a diverse range of of needs um yeah but isn't that wonderful isn't that wonderful that we are actually able to use that expertise in such a diversity of situations which means that our training and our cpd continuing professional development should be to the level that we actually need but the the wonderful thing of working within sports and exercise and especially in lead sports it's just the diversity I traveled in my career from uh, working one-on-one -on -one with athletes to working one-on-one uh, -on -one with coaches and then teams. And then suddenly you've got the Olympic Committee of the Netherlands saying, well, Paul, would you like or be willing to organize the services which uh, uh, imposed on me the fact that I had to reflect on our job, on what we do from an other perspective and couldn't think about this by saying, okay, do we do we need individual consultations? No, we need high level psychologists and sports scientists in that team. I need people from a performance lifestyle up until the continuum of psychiatrists. Yes. So looking at the qualifications, master classes, CPD and so on, it's just a wonderful thing to do and it shows the complexity of our domain. Man. So I, I really resonate with that work that um, you're doing at that group level and I think I find myself in that space in, in a, to a smaller extent of trying to work with coaches to embed psychology um, processes in their training but I probably arrived there in a different way I arrived there through necessity because the resource wasn't there for me to work one-to-one -one with athletes so even if my my core beliefs were around working one-to-one -one with that athlete I've, I had to ask myself okay on point two or on 30 days a year how can I have maximum impact with a group of 150 athletes uh, when I've only got this amount of time okay let, let's work with the coach but but that's met with a lot of kickback sometimes they want to refer out go and see Carl they, they don't want to see it as something yeah, that's, okay. that's down to do you have you it doesn't sound like you've met with too much resistance in that space the the, the, the coaches and organizations you work with are keen to to be part of the solution oh uh, they are uh, but it, it it took also uh, a shift uh, in attitude towards our field uh, when I was asked to look at the system of uh, psychological support to the Olympic and Paralympic team uh, in the Netherlands after the London Games they still had what I call the classical idea as a coach I have an issue with an athlete I'll give a, get a phone call to a psychologist or a, a mental coach he or she will come in solve the problem and that's it 
uh, well, it doesn't work that way because coaches feel, well, the only thing I've learned is uh, knowing the number, the telephone number, mm -hmm. and that's it. Uh, has the athlete progressed? What do I do as coach? Do I need to adapt my coaching and so on and so on? Can I provide more support in the lifestyle program? So when we started to talk about uh, reorganizing the uh, psychological services, we actually decided not to call it psychological services anymore. We call it performance behavior. Okay. Because the basic idea was, uh, as a coach, you should be a professional changer of behavior. That's what you do with your athletes. Okay. You look at, at their behavior, you think th it should be this way, the optimal image, and then coach towards that optimal image. Okay. So part of what uh, behavior change uh, includes is the psychological aspects. So when we talked with the Olympic Committee, I said, well, um, we need to increase the competencies of our coaches to provide that basic element when they work in changing behavior of athletes, teams, and so on. So basic uh, parts of the sports psychologist function is now transferred into the education uh, of our coaches, making them more competent to work on that uh, field, which allows coaches actually to come back to sports psychology saying, this is wonderful. I'm getting stronger by the way in which I'm learning things, by the which I'm able to increase the quality of my coaching and now I have more specific questions for you yeah so where the sports psychologist thought at the beginning oh uh, we're losing uh, work we're losing our coaches you're taking away our quality now actually after four or five years uh, sports psychologists are saying wow this coach is great he's coming with a, an excellent question for example basically it would be a sports psychologist teaching an athlete uh, visualization skills okay okay we do the training blah 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 go into there now the coaches come and say well uh, visualization we've done this as part of the daily routine already but now I have a question for you sports psychologist how can we use visualization in the rehab process that's a that's a wonderful question and delivering those uh, across their teams or individualizing it to those that need so do the coaches ever have that ability to assess who would benefit most from that intervention or is it upskilling them in those general skills and it's down to the athlete to assess whether well it's upscaling the the, the competencies yeah. uh, but also providing uh, coaches with tools to look at what we then call the performance behavior mm -hmm. what does this mean in behavior what do we see on the pitch in the swimming pool next to the tennis court okay and then go further and further into providing the, the tools and methodologies for coaches to actually act upon changing behavior. For example, uh, what we did the couple of years uh, now is working with coaches on uh, the change behavioral management uh, and model of PROHASCA, which means contemplation, pre-contemplation, preparation. Mm -hmm. Now, many of the psychologists are already, oh, wow, this is a, a, a difficult model or this is really in-depth psychology. If you explain it to coaches, suddenly you see in their eyes, oh, that's why it works or doesn't. Uh -huh. And now understand the difference between attitude and intention. Attitude being the basis of, and really have the tendency to do something, while intention is, I'll now go for it. And they think, oh, that's also where it went wrong. I thought the attitude of the athlete was there to prepare, but it was only an intention. So once in a while. And, and then you see that their competencies comes to such a level that they're able to think with you as psychologists. Okay? They're not psychologists, but you give them the expertise and tools to look at behavior from a psychological point of view. And they're not a threat to sports psychologists. But in the beginning, it was a little bit like, oh, and so on and so on. Yeah. And if you, sorry, sorry. Do you get this? <clears throat> Obviously, you're working at Olympic level there. Yeah. Um, and, and the Paralympic. coaches and Paralympic. Yeah. And, and the level of coaching is quite high. Um, do you think there's a difference across different sports when you try to implement something like that? So very limited experience being around this with an EPP audit, as my example, from professional football. And... I certainly saw from the outside of being involved in the EPP a little bit that they had this, we need a sports psychologist, and they just 
almost went, what is a sports psychologist? And we just need to tick the box without, I don't think, realising what they actually wanted. So where's that level of education once you go into a club? But also, where's that externally facing level of education? So people can actually look up, but what do we need? Do we need that clinical side? Do we need that performance side? What is it we want and how do we get that? There's a, just a first point on that because I, I probably have been critical in the past um, of that each but I, I remember getting the first opportunity in football and, and, and thinking brilliant football finally wants psychology and then realising quickly oh no football has to have psychology there's a there's a subtle subtle difference but that aside it's created a, so many good opportunities for us for, for us to be there I think football's doing a lot to embed uh, interdisciplinary support uh, support in, in, in supporting young people a million miles away from where we need to be but we, we, we've got a, a better start point now um, so but they get an understanding of what you do and what an S&C does and what yeah but for, just to give you one example I remember the first uh, audits that we did it was it was almost prescriptive where's your um, when, where's your personality profiling and, and I would have to kick back for two or three years I, I don't do it because that's not how I practice so I had to fight hard to not do something so they're almost dictating the philosophy and approach that you're you're taking as a, as a practitioner but in fairness they did give you that freedom to to sort of shape okay this is what psychology is going to look like in, in your academy I was, was very lucky at Leicester City that they they supported that but to start with you're right there they, they didn't seem to be a clear idea of uh, of what it was going to look like but there would have been someone leading that process and it would be from their vision and their their but it didn't give each practitioner a chance to to, to grow but we're, we're getting there I don't know if you've had it Similar. Well, uh, as you said, it's a little bit different at the probably at the uh, elite or Olympic or mm. Paralympic level, where uh, the basic idea is uh, athlete at the center, driven by coach, supported by experts. So in that sense, the role and the, the the pattern of roles is very clear. We support coaches to be better to work with uh, athletes. In that sense, it's very clear. So uh, it makes sense to make the coach as strong as possible. But making that coach stronger is absolutely part of coach education. So the point I'm always making towards uh, Olympic and elite coaches, and especially NGBs, is the stronger the coach, the better they can use my expertise so I do not have to come in and say what I think the coach should do no I should come in and the coach should say Paul can you help me with this or what's your reflection on this or provide me with this kind of information because that's the next step I, I want to take that's where we need our coaches to be so the basic element of sports psychology support is not in essence the sports psychologist. Yeah, it's, it's a coach. Yeah. Okay. And I had a, a wonderful time now uh, talking in soccer and uh, football in uh, with uh, uh, the club PSP Eindhoven, and uh, they have a head coach Mark van Bommel. Mm -hmm. uh, he's a wonderful guy, but he's uh, I won't say. Um, uh, taking it at a, at a distance but he's, he's waiting until he feels there's an added value to his coaching yeah so if I would come in and say uh, uh, Mark uh, I'm going to do this and this for you this is not what uh, the head coach wants I mean uh, because he's well correctly he's in charge now what can you provide me so I can become stronger to work with my team Okay, that's the question I'm waiting for. And do you get that a lot from the coaches that they want that your service to to underpin what they do, or do you get what Carl mentioned a little bit before that um, they want to tick a box and they want the, to do some visualization or some profiling? Yeah, w where is it at the moment? Well, sometimes we we got the the latter one, uh, but once again, uh, as you're in, as I'm in the. Olympic uh, committee we've got let's say the, in between brackets the power to say this is not the way to work as a coach okay uh, and then you've got two alternatives first of all oh okay what can I improve or okay then then I don't need this now we have an in-between level between my support and the coach uh, we were a group of performance managers 
these are my colleagues who are in depth in the program working with the NGBs so they already know what the coaches are like what they need and so on so when I come in I can already anticipate what they need so it's uh, it's making my input more flexible and more direct rather than saying oh who are you and what will you provide to us at that level it, if that would occur then we're not working well at the elite level it's, it's really empowering for the coach and it, it, it feels like uh, cycle is probably not quite the right term but I always felt for coaches six seven years ago um, in, in certain sports because they were almost stripped away of each responsibility because we had nutritionists physio biomechanics psychologists and, it, and, and I as a coach I used to be all of these things and now it's like well what do I do I fill out session plans and that's not what I signed up for. I used to be pitch side doing stuff and now I feel like admin and pick the team. But to empower them this way and, and make use of the advances in sports science and psychology yeah. is, is, is a great place to be. But it's, it still re- uh, requires us as an Olympic team to actively uh, involve those coaches. For example, we have every year two times a, a national coach platform. The next one is in April, is on the topic of interdisciplinary teams. Mm-hmm. How do you work with an interdisciplinary team? Because it can be uh, sometimes harrowing to have a find uh, and find an expert in psychology, an expert in uh, physio, an expert in medicine, in strength and conditioning, and you're sitting there as coach and saying, oh, guys, yeah. how can I manage this? Okay, so we need to. Uh, empower the coach and give them the tools to work with those expertise but we also need to ensure that the psychologist can talk with the SNC expert or the nutritionist so that the interdisciplinary work is also guaranteed and that's when I look at education and that's something I mentioned uh, when presenting in Belfast for the British uh, Society of Psychology the education is not enough of our uh, sports psychology graduates Uh, how many of them actually know what the physio does or doesn't do the nutritionist so if there is lacking uh, in knowledge how can you expect them later on to collaborate Uh, in an interdisciplinary team so in that sense we need to upgrade if you talk about the elite sport we need to upgrade the content of what we give our uh, students in psychology or sports psychology so that they're, they're not working in those silos of their their, their sport I mean, but to have that psychologically safe environment where mem- different practitioners don't feel like they have to justify their role and feel like i've got the best knowledge to answer this performance question um that, that's rare at the moment but where the yes. most enjoyable environments are when we are you know contributing to a performance question we've been talking about this uh, uh, in in our student athletes and with our practitioners here about you know what's the difference between multidisciplinary and interdisciplinary we're sort of reducing it down to the difference between having six plans and one um we get lost in the process sometimes but for me it's that has the athlete got one one plan Mm. or have they got six have they got their nutrition plan their their, their Mm. sports psych plan yeah and, and just one other thing, because it's just picking up on some of the other things you said about athlete-centred, person-centred. It's a little bugbear of mine. I, I think we're at, a, we're at an interesting time where there is a lot of knowledge spread around. And people, myself included, I'm sure, we, we've got used to say, knowing the right thing to say. And these buzzwords get thrown around. And I'm looking, is that really athlete-centred? Is that really... Play-? But when you talk, I really get a sense that, no, that, that is going on. Um, you know, we are athlete-centred. But we've been in rooms where, this is we're athlete centered and there's no athlete in the room and i'm thinking are we athlete centered i mean no. has that taken a while to do that or oh it has it has uh, i've been now doing this uh, for the dutch olympic Club for the last five years but i would say it's only now that we're getting at speed where coaches accept that for example it's not silo work it's yeah. not uh, the psychologist and then the snc expert or nutritionist uh, no we're, they now expect us to talk amongst ourselves and come up with possible solutions the coach can use. So I need to talk with if it's about uh, uh, eating disorders. 
It's not me as psychologist coming in and saying this and this. No, I first talk with the medical uh, doctor and the physiotherapist and the nutritionist. And let's come up with a plan with A, B and C to talk with the coach. And let's the coach as case manager then say, OK, I think at this moment, this is the best approach. But the coach takes, the, the, uh, you said case manager there. Yes. The coach is it's yes. coach led. It's their fault. It is. Yeah, yeah, it's so great. it means, uh, OK, it's a huge responsibility. But in essence, that's the responsibility of the coach. And especially on a national level, elite level, Olympic level, that's what I think we can expect from them. Yeah. But we need to be able to give them the competencies to do that job. Yeah. Okay. And now the discussion between, well, with two disciplines, how do you collaborate? The closest uh, I see in my team is between performance lifestyle, coaches, and sports psychologists. Mm. And I remember when I started, I have a team of 31 experts uh, working for our system. Uh, I have 12 uh, PL, so performance lifestyle coaches, and uh, 10 uh, sports psychologists. And I ask them separately the same question. Uh, what is the top 10 of what you think you're adding to the system? And of those top 10, what do you feel you should do? Or what could the PL do if you're a sports psychologist or the, uh, the other way around? So, in essence, of the two lists, eight out of ten was similar in between them. Yeah. But all of them said that they were the only responsible to take in hand or on board the ten sim. Yeah. So we had an, an, not a convergence actually, an overlap. So uh, I tried then to, to look at, well, can we separate those two? Can we separate the sports psychologist from uh, the, the performance lifestyle when we talk about you, Carl, as a, as a athlete or as coach? It doesn't work that way. You can't uh, fine tune it so you say, oh, it's, this is psychology or sports psychology and this is performance lifestyle. So I, I had to shift my perspective and said, well, let's take uh, the fact that we are both as groups professionals. How can we collaborate rather than separate what we do? So instead of trying to define what the PL is and only does and the sports psychology on this, no, how can I increase the competences of both to actually recognize if we talk about the case call that we may have uh, some aspects which the psychologist may take into hand or the PL or may take the lead and so on. So it's not about separating actually but empowering them to collaborate. Yeah. Which to some extent works better than separating. Absolutely. Yeah. But it's, it's not all uh, uh, 100% as it, it should work. How have you been able to do it and yeah. where have the difficulties been? Uh, well, um, once again, the work at the Olympic level and Paralympic level gives you some leverage. <laughs> Uh, the leverage of being the, the central position, the leverage of actually also to some extent having the tools, uh, the expertise, but also the financial backing to do some things, but also showing that what you actually do is relevant and an added value. So it's not like I have to convince you or uh, wrestle your arm because I have the financial means. It's also showing the quality. So, uh, and after five years, uh, as I said, after three years now, I think that coaches are willing and PLs and sports psychologists are willing to collaborate and work in the interdisciplinary, interdisciplinary team. Uh, where we fail is uh, due to the lack of competencies of the individual not recognizing or not wanting to recognize that it may be a win-win and just think, oh, this is a loss for me because the other one will do it. Okay. Uh, I must admit that if that's the case, sometimes I have to reflect on saying goodbye to that individual because okay. it's not adding to the system. Uh, with all due respect for the, the individual, but if you do not add your expertise to the system, well, it doesn't work that way, okay? For you, is there, is there a, a, a natural um, start point? Because, you know, I always think of uh, some of the sports where I felt like there needs to be a culture shift. I feel like in some cases I could have saved myself two years if on the first day I'd asked to see the best player 
and the captain and got them to ask to see me in front of everyone. If, if I'd done that, I would have saved two years of, of just seeing the players with problems. Yeah. But for you, when you, if you went into a new organisation tomorrow, is there a natural first? Well, uh, I would say uh, there's a personal style I use. Uh, first of all, I would never, sh- never show up without having uh, had to talk with uh, the coach understanding what the coach expects or does not expect okay one of the second steps i would propose to the coach is give me the opportunity from afar to observe training to look at uh, how you communicate how you collaborate without the pressure of having to intervene yes just to absolutely see, yeah, yeah. and even almost when i talk with my uh, my younger colleagues which i mentor i say you have got that the inter- uh, you can't actually uh, have an interaction you need to learn how to become part of the, what we call the decor. Mm-hmm. You should be there without being there. Okay? If you're able to do that, and sometimes it takes a couple of months, then you can think about what could I add to what I'm seeing rather than using what you learned and then suddenly say, oh, we need, uh, we need communication skills. Well, is that the case? after two or three months observation should be able to see whether or not that's uh, the issue so it's a fairly conservative step by step it can be accelerated if the coach says okay uh, it's clear to me what you can add these are specific questions i want you to address and then i'll ask the coach can you take the lead in bringing this to the athlete or the team because once again it's not me working one-on-one it's providing you as coach the knowledge to work with the athletes or to give me the possibility to work with the athlete because it adds to your coaching is part of that is part of that consideration that they already have the credibility in the relationship with the athlete that's the assumption okay yeah okay but sometimes you are best positioned to deliver those messages uh yes yeah but that's also something you have to be able to talk with your coach about uh and also the other way around uh, i had a, a long time ago i had a, a basketball coach um I was working with uh, with the team and the coach, and uh, they played uh, against uh, uh, another team, and there was a, a fight at the end, a really big fight. So going into the next match, the coach uh, feared that uh, there may be once again be some troubles on the court. So he said to me, well, Paul, uh, you know what? You will come in into the dressing room before we play and you will say that they cannot fight, they have to behave and so on. I said, well, first of all, with all due respect, who am I to say this to your players? Secondly, uh, even if I'm recognized as being part of the coaching staff, why would they accept that from me? And thirdly, what's the content of the message? Naughty boys, uh, yeah. watch out what you do. So in that sense, let's reverse the system. If you want to have an impact on your team, then if the message comes from you as a coach, so I, I'm able to talk with you on how to prepare that kind of message. How do you deliver it? Reflect on the content. So we we changed the approach. Uh, there was a little bit of a scuffle at the end, but uh, the message was very clear. The coach is in control. But if you put me there in the dressing room, you're actually giving me as coach, uh, uh, well, a sports athlete from the coach, the control of your coaching process. That's not my, that's not my role. Yeah. Uh, and sometimes younger colleagues will say, wow, I, I was able to talk with this uh, group and team and before the match I g- delivered an important message. Well, uh, subconsciously or sometimes consciously, you actually reverse the system of control and leadership from the coach to the sports psychologist. That's not our job. We've heard how Paul created a culture of performance behaviour within the Dutch Olympic and Paralympic programmes by upskilling coaches in understanding behaviour change and making coaches more competent in utilising various psychological skills. He has highlighted the importance of collaborating with all performance support specialists to create an interdisciplinary team where the athlete has one plan to enhance performance. We're now going to hear from Paul regarding where the sports psychology industry is heading in the future and how industry and academia must work together to ensure graduates are ready to work in the real world.
If I would know the answer to that, <laughs> I would probably be rich and uh, call myself Madame Blanche and, uh, <laughs> and so on. That's not the case. Uh, it feels like we're go. It feels like, and I, and I don't mean that in a bad way. It feels uh, like we're becoming more diverse, diverse. Yeah, in yeah. the company. Yeah, we do, and I think we're trying uh, slowly to adapt to what the expectations are in the field. Yeah. Uh, I also know that in the same time we need to observe boundaries. Um, and the boundaries must become stronger and stronger. So while we diversify, we need to set the boundaries very clear that, for example, if it's about eating disorders, we're not the sole expert in this. We need to collaborate before we actually do something. So yes, we need to know more about eating disorders, for example, know more about nutritional value and so on, but we first need to talk with others. So diversify, but clarify the boundaries. Yeah. Okay. The second point is that the field as, uh, as such, uh, sports psychology, um, is becoming underfinanced in research. Uh, research is now going, uh, and, and it's good, but looking at people, uh, exercise, movement, obesity, and so on, which is great. We need to address those uh, points. But I now see that researchers are veering away from, for example, elite sports to uh, exercise and exercise psychology because that's where the money is. So uh, if you look at uh, where are we going, it depends on who's the financing this. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I had a, a wonderful visit here in Lover and, uh, and uh, a good program. And, uh, Very and relaxing week for you. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> I'll be back. Uh, I had a, the f uh, a couple of meetings with people from, uh, for example, the English Institute of Sport and UK Sport. And to some extent, we came back to the point of education of sports psychologists and the route that is taken by organizations like BASIS or BPS or in, in Europe, uh, different organizations. Uh, what I found was that... Uh, uh, by the uh, the fact that we or I am working, we are working, call at the elite level, we sometimes have a feeling that what education provides is not enough. But asking academia to solve that issue, well, there's a, a lack of experience. And even I, as a full-time professor, uh, if I would not be in the applied field, I would probably stick with the basic elements of sports psychology. Now I say, no, we need to uh, have people from business, elite sports, coming in saying, this is what we need. We're going to help you increase the quality of education. So I said to my colleague in one of the organizations, we have to take responsibility, not as uh, from academia, but from being the applied field and saying, what do we expect? And how can we help you, universities, to increase the quality and enhance the uh, education of the, the next generation? And to give you an example, in the Netherlands, we have a postgraduate in sports psychology in the University of Amsterdam, a two-year program. But when I then look at the end competency profile, I would never say you can start tomorrow at the Olympic level. No. There's a lack of experience. There's a lack of uh, uh, knowledge about elite sports. So instead of saying uh, you're not doing the job you have to do in university, I say as a, uh, from the Olympic Committee, I need to provide the opportunities for those postgraduates to come in into elite sports and learn by doing. So I'm actually now looking at creating internships because it's my responsibility after Tokyo or Beijing or Paris to provide new, let's say, new people coming into the system. If I wait until they do it for me, I'm not able to provide the new generation. So I, the business or the other side also has a, a responsibility. And it's not unusual. As a professor in uh, at the university, I know that business life, like in IT, for example, Business life will say to university, well, the graduates you provide, yeah. 
it must be stronger the next they say, generation they say the same thing that it's, it, it's problem solving it's communication it's decision making these are the things that so us working in the supplied field it's exactly the same mm. in all these areas what they say but like you've just said it's then well can you open the door so they can get that experience mm. whilst at university and that's where the challenge comes allowing yeah. the students to get in gain that experience before they leave and that's really our job to try and make that happen and we're, we're, and we're starting to do that with our volunteer opportunities for our master's students but it's been hard work in a, getting agreement on what's ethically appropriate tasks for an MSc student Especially to do. for you, yeah. Yeah, but for me, there's valuable stuff they can do in terms of task analysis, observation skills, um, just, just organising data and feeding back on uh, in, in workshops and general educational stuff, producing educational materials. There's a lot that a master's student, an undergrad, can do to be part of a, a broader psychology programme as long as they're supervised by, by senior people and, and we're getting there. Paul, thanks so much. Um, yeah, uh, absolute pleasure talking to you. I really appreciate it. No, thank you. Thank you very much for your time. What a great chat with Paul and Carl. We've heard how within elite sport, sports psychology has started to move away from just one-to-one -one consultations towards a performance behaviour approach with experts upskilling coaches to embed behavioural change within practice. We've heard about the challenges that this approach can have and how it can be successfully implemented in the Dutch Olympic and Paralympic programme. We've heard how the future of sports psychology will continue to diversify within boundaries and how the education of sports psychology and all sporting industries need to work together with academia and practice to enhance quality of graduates for the future. If you want to get in touch and let us know any subject areas or experts that you'd be keen to listen to, then contact me, Martin Foster, on m.foster at alborough.ac.uk or tweet me at martinfoster82. Bye for now. We'll see you next time.